name is Mike Herschel. I work for Lullabot. I'm a front end developer there. Um, Lullabot is a sponsor of my trip here, so hell yeah, right? Mm -hmm. I've been doing Drupal for seven years. I'm a user experience fanatic, and I'm a big believer that speed is essential to user experience. And um, you know, Drupal, obviously, is not sometimes the fastest platform around, but there's ways that you can uh, ways that you can kick it up, up and up. So I have some statistics here that I uh, I made up. <laughs> so if your website doesn't load in like a millis nanosecond, your conversion rate will decrease by one million. People will post bad reviews on it, regardless of anything they did. And your competitors are going to giggle. So I had a, actually like a bunch of real statistics that I, I gave this kind of a version of this presentation before, and uh, like a lot of this is kind of true. Like your conversion rate will go down, um, but you guys are right here. You guys know that speed is important. So, yeah. So another thing that I did right here is there's a beer in the corner. So the beer in the corner means that I, I love talking about this type of stuff. And if you want to hit me up later at the after party or on the street, give me a beer and I will talk to you about this. I'll probably talk to you off. It's pretty cool. So what to expect on this, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about back-end tuning and, and server admin uh, configuration. Some Drupal tuning, right? Because if you don't cache your stuff within Drupal, you're kind of out of luck there. Front-end front -end performance, which to me is uh, super important as a front-end developer, right? Um, and some testing of baselines. But the first thing is KISS. What I do here? Right. right? So keep it simple, stupid. Um, if you have a slow site that shouldn't be slow, don't throw complexity on the problem. Don't, um, don't throw caching, redis, all this stuff on top of something if, if, it's, slower than it, if it's slower than it should be. And um, troubleshoot the actual issue, you know, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about this, kind of going in there. Find out where that choke point is, and at that point, go there. And once you get it, once you get your site up to par, at that point, you can throw in some of the stuff we're going to talk about right here. So, everything kind of starts with web server. You know, web server will obviously take the request in. Um, some Apache is not set up for complex content management systems by default. Uh, I had a, and I kind of learned this the hard way right here. Um, there's a lot of uh, good information on, on tuning this, but uh, lower, so lower your max clients in httpd.com, and so what what will happen is your max clients. I, I think Apache might set it to like 100 and something by default. I, I kind of forget what it should kind of be a lot less in the neighborhood, like around 10 or 15, 20 or something like that. And the reason this is because Drupal uses memory. Like a standard, a standard Drupal process will be using anywhere from you know 25 to 50, possibly more megabytes of, of RAM. And if you run out of RAM, it's going to prevent your operating function. You're going to have crashes, reboots, etc. Um, tuning your database. So the easiest thing to do with your database is run through MySQL Tuner. <coughs> so if you go to this URL right here, MySQL Tuner Tuner.pl, it actually will download Perl script, right? And if you run this Perl script from your from your command line, it won't, it's, it's not actually going to change anything, so it's kind of safe. But it's going to look at your configuration. It's going to look at the size of your database tables, and it is going to make recommendations based on that. And that's that's pretty awesome, right there. Um, if you're setting up if you're setting up a server by uh, fr from the from the ground up, Percona has a configuration wizard. Where you can tell it what type of what type what you're doing here, what what you're going through, and what type of server you have, what type of memory you have, and it will output a my.cnf file that you can plug into uh, MySQL. That'll give you a pretty good start. So uh, Drupal 7 uses NoDB database engine. Um, Drupal 6, if you saw Drupal 6, um, it uses it, you, you're going to want to switch to that, which is a, uh, a database query. Um, 
increase the NODB buffer size. So this is this is one of the big wins that you, that you can do within your my.cnf. Figure out how much memory you have available. Figure out your database size um, that you're using, and try to increase that buffer size as large as you can get away with. And that's going to take a lot of stuff off your disk, put it in the memory, and at that point, obviously, that's a that's going to be a lot quicker. Uh, MySQL query cache. You know, I've I've heard from uh, from another person that it's not a good idea. I've seen I've seen increases on the D6 site that I've done by turning it on. My SQL query cache is not uh, enabled by default. I think it's turned on, but I think it's at the zero or one or something like that, if I remember correctly. Um, that's something to experiment with. And check your throw <coughs> this, comes, this comes into troubleshooting the actual problem. Find out what the, find out where, find out what queries are running slow and look at them. And, Figure out how figure out how to mitigate those, how to cache those, rewrite them if you need to. Um, I mean, that's obviously the big right here. So this is a normal hosting environment, and you can see I got like the guy by his computer from the '80s or something like that. Anyway, so in a normal hosting environment, you have you, you have your '80s guy. He'll do a request, he'll talk to Apache, Apache will invoke PHP, PHP will talk to Drupal, Drupal will pull in data from the database environment, right? Again, it's, it's kind of a long process, but it's a standard process. It's, it's something that works pretty well. But well, some of the wins that you can you can do is by throwing some caching in there. So one of the one of the uh, best things, well all of these are actually kind of recommended. Throw a metcache for Redis, and especially for uh, um, if you if you have a lot of authenticated users, uh, memcache and Redis are are uh, services that sit in between Drupal and MySQL. And Drupal will actually put once you configure it, it will put uh, selected database tables within within the within either of these programs, whatever you're using. And um, so you're you're stored in memory at that point, and there's there's less. Uh, Less of a process to 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 get your data from MySQL, which especially like for cache tables and stuff like that, it's uh, it's pretty important. Um, with PHP, um, you're going to want to install an opcode cache. PHP 5.5 comes with a built-in one; it just needs to be configured. If you run anything less than that, um, you're going to need you're going to need APC. APC. There's there's a couple different ones, but um, it's you can kind of Google install a APC on my server and it kind of just you can figure it out. It's not terribly difficult. Um, if you warning though, if you're um, if you're installing APC, uh, make sure that you increase your PHP memory limit to to whatever your uh, Drupal <coughs> process size is, which you can find by the top on the server. And um, so you want to increase it over that. If you don't do that, you're going to have fragmentation, and it can actually have a negative effect on your on your site performance. So that's something that that you set in your INI file. You can you can see at the bottom where I say uh, your APC SHM size SHM size I don't know what the heck it is, but um, it's important. So a reverse proxy like Varnish is it? Has anybody heard of Varnish? I mean, I'm guessing most people have. It's pretty much standard if, if you use an Acquia Pantheon or uh, I'm guessing maybe uh, Commerce Guys new platform SH, they probably have Varnish installed. And Varnish basically will take, will, will cache your entire HTML uh, content and, and your static assets and deliver that to, to the client without even touching Drupal. So that, like the fastest, the, the fastest way to speed up Drupal back end is by not using Drupal. Right, not <laughs> static, and um, yeah, so that's pretty awesome. So, and then uh, throw a content a delivery network on top of it. So, <coughs> if you do that, uh, there's a couple of different benefits. Number one, it does this; it does a very similar thing to as Varnish does. It'll cache, it'll cache a lot of your assets, and it can cache your HTML. But 
something that we're going to talk about in a little bit is you'll actually split up your static assets across multiple domains, which will enable more simultaneous downloads from the front end, which is pretty cool. So this is salt and pepper from the, uh, I guess, I don't know if this is 90s or 80s. 80s. 80s? It's a pretty, pretty cool song there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I had fun making it. You know, so I wanted something edgy, right? So when you think edgy, you think salt and pepper, right? So it's like, we're not talking about sex and treatment, actually. So you guys have seen this screen under performance, performance, uh, you know, under development performance. So there's a bunch of cool stuff right here. Caching and aggregating and stuff like that. So some of this stuff is a little, um, less clear than it should be. So caching pages for anonymous users. That does exactly what you think it does. It actually caches the pages for anonymous users. Go figure. That's good. You know, it's good to be, uh, it'll store the entire HTML within your cache tables, which will either reside in the database, or Metcache, or Redis, if you're using that. Caching blocks, uh, that should be enabled. Uh, there's a setting within views that we'll talk about too to cache your views blocks. Um, it has to be explicitly enabled. The amount of time before the cache is cleared. So this actually needs to be enabled for block cache, um, which is kind of a, something that is not clear from the get-go. And the expiration of cache pages, this actually sets an HTTP header that will affect your content delivery network or varnish and stuff like that. You know, and it will often talk to your, it will, your browser will cache your uh, assets based on that too. This is PHP to GZIP or HTML. Typically, you don't need to have this turned on because Apache should, should be GZIP and everything. Um, I'll talk about what GZIP is in a second, but basically, it's just like it's just compressing your data as it comes down. And then, like these two checkboxes, right? It's, you know, keep them checked, and if they're not checked. You know, like what the hell? I, I like if, if I see a website, I like a Drupal website. I'm like, I always constantly like, hey, you know, I'm gonna look at the source. I'm gonna see the modules they're using. And if I see, if I see that they're not uh, aggregating your CSS, you know, like, yeah, come on, guys. It's kind of, I don't know. I'm kind of gonna. Uh, anyway, whatever. Caching, right? Use so. The way to make Drupal faster, right, is to kind of take Drupal out of it. So by caching stuff, by putting it into your cache tables, which will hopefully reside in uh, Redis or something similar to that, it will um, it'll speed things up, right? So it won't have to run that database query. So you can see these options right here under caching. You can you can set your, your query results and your rendered output. Um, Query results cached will cache the database results for a set time period. That's pretty. That's pretty straightforward. You know, I want to. I want to cache my query, my database query results for an hour. You know, um, the rendered output cache doesn't doesn't cache the database query, but it will cache. It will query the database and see if there's any or the query results cache. And if there's any change, it will it will change the rendered output HTML. Um, you, you should probably be using both of these on every view that you're using. Um, there's, ways, there's ways to clear that cache if you're changing or updating nodes, if that's a concern, if you need stuff to update a little bit quicker. Um, <laughs> block caching, if you have used blocks, you need to explicitly enable this right here. And you can see some of these options. There's a module that I, sh I probably should have in, uh, in these slides here called uh, Views Cache Bully. I think it's just some type of something like that, and it will it will kind of it, it provides a better interface to do this and kind of forces that. Um, that's something that I think is obviously pretty important. So I, I photoshopped this right here. It looks real, doesn't it? Do you see like how there's um, little crosses and the text? That took some time. Okay. <laughs> And all the time I put in this presentation, that was probably I heard like eighty percent of it. <laughs> so, talking about control modules. So, the bloated code base. Everybody's dealt with this crap. This is this is a website I worked. Actually, this is the Florida Drupal Camp 2013 website. Um, 
which was handed down from, I think, Asheville, actually, to Atlanta, to us. I think Chattanooga is still around. Yeah, yeah. RSC is currently on it. And um, I think, like, during the whole process, people just started enabling the crap, you know? And during that, you're kind of scared to take stuff out because you don't know what's going to break. And if you do take stuff out, then you have to do a whole kind of QA cycle to see what's going to screw up. So this is, this is the module page, all right? And these are just enabled modules, right? I'm going back now. But like, it's a crap load of modules. And it's gonna, it, it slows stuff down. So be, don't, like, like what I'm saying is, enable modules with a purpose. Don't go in and, and, and enable stuff on production, which is obviously, obviously you shouldn't be doing, without knowing, knowing what its purpose, and, and if you can find another way to do it without doing a whole module or something like that, or if you can do it, if you can somehow customize it, you know. But not all modules are bad. There's there's a lot of modules in here that actually kind of help help you out and help speed things up. So views light pager. So if if you're looking at your views output and you have your pager at the bottom, typically it'll say like page one of sixteen or page one of whatever, you know. So in order to get that sixteen right there, page one of sixteen, it needs to do it needs to do a count. You know, it needs to know exactly what it needs to know how many results there are, and needs to do that calculation. Views like pager basically removes that, it just gives you a next and previous button. And honestly, that's kind of, for most user experience purposes, that is all that you're going to need. So that's something that can um, obviously uh, simplify your database queries. <coughs> if you're using GoDaddy, <coughs> shame on you. Um, Boost. Boost is kind of kind of like a static page generator for Drupal, where um, it, 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 it will it will render your HTML, put it into static files in a directory within your uh, web room, and you, it'll modify your HTTP access file to serve that up in the event that it exists. And if there's a change, it'll rewrite it. And it's it's kind of just like a poor man's varnish, right? And it works pretty decently. Um, if you have authenticated users, I ran into issues, and this is a long time ago because I haven't used it in a while, and, uh, where the authenticated and unauthenticated sessions would get mixed up. I'm, uh, if I were to guess, I'd probably think they'd probably have it resolved. But it's something that's uh, like a great idea, pretty awesome, right? Um, if you're using a lot of authenticated traffic, number one, Make sure you're using Redis and Memcache. Offcache is a um, complicated module. What it will do is it'll it'll it will render the majority of the page static, um, like the static elements of the page from cache, and then the customized elements that are, it will load via AJAX. And that's something that can um, obviously speed things up. You know, any type of caching, removing database queries, removing, all this processing will, will help out the back end of things. And any cache, if you have a lot of references, if you have um, if you have complex entity types, it can make a difference right here. Don't throw it in if, you, if, if, you're, if you're not quite knowing what you're doing or if you don't need it. You know, don't throw complexity at the problem. There's a discussion down here where um, they, they uh, it's they talk about um, the pros and cons, when it's useful, when it's not. And it's a little bit too much to obviously include in the slide, but if you're looking at using it, use it, you know. So Image API Optimize uses third-party uh, image optimizing services to automatically optimize your image to remove those precious bytes and stuff like that, you know, to, to help uh, help preserve your bandwidth, which is, of course, pretty pretty uh, important for mobile users. So advanced CSS JS aggregation is a really cool and awesome module. So where it says just release stable version, that was like last year. But, um, so it, Drupal by default will create groups of aggregated files. It will create groups of aggregated CSS and JavaScript. And honestly, there's not in my opinion, there's not a really 
good reason to do that. It increases your HTTP requests. This gives you the option to simplify that and make it one, aggregate it into one file, and uh, it does minification. It does a lot of really good stuff that that is best practices. Um, troubleshoot your issues, right? Develop and performance logging and monitoring, which is pretty cool because it enables some interesting performance logs and can log directly to the database, which of course isn't the best thing to do on production, but um, if you can replicate it in uh, any type of dev environment, that's awesome. Uh, Devel is obviously, if you're a Drupal developer, you're using Devel, I can guarantee it, or you should be at least. Um, it supports XHPOF, that has page, page timer memory usage. There's, <coughs> you can find presentations that are much longer than this one specifically about develop, and you know, honestly they're awesome. Front end is kind of a passion right here for me. So 80 to 90% of the end user response time is spent in front end, start there. So we're gonna go into Google Chrome developer tools a little bit. I'm gonna show you like the waterfall display that shows for a, uh, uh, a uh, you know a standard web page. So Steve Souders, he he was the uh, like chief performance engineer at Google. I think he works for this company called Fastly now. I don't even know what they do. Um, so the golden rule is about twenty percent of the time is taken of the of the generation time is taken in the back end, right? But 80% is in the front end. If you can simplify that front end uh, process, if you can simplify your HTTP request, your 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 uh, bandwidth, all that, that's you're gonna you're gonna see real gains right now. Um, I during during a little bit of time where at, at Lullabot, where I was um, in between some client projects, I did a little bit of just looking around on on uh, our web page. We we knocked down the uh, the bandwidth from I think like 1.6 megabytes to 1.2 megabytes just by switching some pings to JPEGs, right? Because JPEGs, if you're not using any type of transparency effects, um, are a lot, a, a, take up a lot less bandwidth than PNGs. And sometimes there's like some super easy wins right there. That's like almost like a third of the bandwidth removed. You know, that's that's kind of a, it's kind of a cool thing. So, HTTP request. All right. So if you go into Chrome Tools. I'm gonna talk about this in a bit. Every single one of these is an HTTP request right here. So every website is made up of multiple different files, and when the each after you after you download your your initial HTML document, um, your browser will reach out and grab all the assets that needs to be JavaScript, images, fonts, um, a lot of different things. And it takes time to download those. It has to download it has to download them in order to so it can then render the HTML. And it, when, it renders it, when it renders the HTML, it still downloads stuff afterwards. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do on the front end to render the HTML a little bit earlier. Um, I can talk about some of that too. And have some of the mod critical stuff download after the HTML is loaded. Because it's not, it's not just about um, having everything download quickly, which, which is important. It's about the perception, you know? Perception of quickness because speed is about speed is about user experience. You can see the number of requests over there. So the easiest way to limit your HTTP requests is by cutting them out. Uh, modern browsers have will download six uh, six items at a time. So if you have, say, 70, uh, if you have 60 uh, HTTP requests, it's going to download the initial one, it'll download six, six, six. That's kind of a per domain thing. Um, when you use a content delivery network, your static assets are going to be spread across multiple domains. And it will download, the, it will download six from one domain concurrently as six from another. So that's the additional benefit of a content delivery network where you can do a lot of networks. Like, HTTP requests start with the design process. And I'm guessing, you know, most people in this room are not designers, but this is kind of important. <coughs> if you can 
limit yourself to like an icon font or stuff like that for your icons as opposed to doing um, individual images or something like that, that can, that can help out. CSS image sprites, inline images, and icon fonts. Is, it, is anybody here familiar with what inline base 64 coded images are? Fonts? I see a couple of You can embed images within the HTML of your document, right? It sounds like a horrible idea, but you can do it. <laughs> but it's not necessarily a bad idea. If you're using like really small images, like little icons, like two or three kilobyte files, it's actually not a bad idea. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a better idea to embed it in, within your CSS too, because your CSS is cached. One of, the, one of the downsides about embedding it within your HTML is that you go to a different HTML page that has the same image, you're going to have to read all that data. But if you use the site-wide CSS file, it's going to stay cached. Image sprites. So basically, you combine your background images into one big image, right? So instead of having 30 odd images there, you will have one HTTP request. And you will use CSS background position, background size property to selectively show the appropriate image on the appropriate element, on the background of the appropriate element. Um, if you do it manually, it's a complete pain in the ass, right? You have to individually move stuff around. Um, if you're using SAS and Compass as a front end developer, which hopefully you are because it's pretty awesome, it, it handles it for you. And kind of Google compass and sprites, and then just do it. Right? You know, there's there's some tricky parts, especially if you're using retina images and stuff. But it's all it's all doable. Inline images, right? So this is kind of what I just talked about right here. The kind of the kind of basic support codes that you can throw it into your HTML, your CSS. <coughs> IE8 uh, supports maybe you up. I guess I have up in there. Supports only up to 32 kilobyte images. I don't, if I have an image that large, I'm not going to inline it. Um, part of the reason is because your, your browser has to decode the base 64, make it binary, and that takes a little bit of work. Um, for smaller, under 5K images, I think it's a pretty viable solution. Um, it'll save an HTTP request, makes your CSS longer, but you're being, you're, you're g-zipping, right? You're, you're compressing your file, and I said I was going to talk about this, so and I'll, I'll show you maybe an exa example when we open up Pro Tools. But um, Apache Nginx will automatically, should, it, should be automatically, basically zipping up your HTML and then sh shooting it down to, shooting it down to your, uh, your browser, and it'll also do the same for a lot of static assets, like including CSS and JavaScript. Um, if you use SVGs, there's you can tell it to do SVGs also, which SVGs are pretty awesome. You should be doing that. I don't have that code, so, so you can probably just Google it. But it doesn't handle SVGs by default, so heads up. It's a pain in the ass, but SAS and Compass make everything easy, right? You see that little inline images, point to the picture, and it'll just kind of do it for you. So I think I talked about this a little bit. Spreading, spreading your HTTP requests across multiple servers. So this right here is just like a simple template.php function to uh, load jQuery from, from Google C, uh, CDN, which of course, the, the good part of that is a lot of times uh, Google, a lot of websites do this, so it might already be cached by the browser, which if that, that even saves you additional issues. But of course, Google CDN is obviously pretty, pretty fast. Um, there is a module, I forget what it's called, that will, if you're not using the CDN and you want to get some of those parallel request benefits, it will actually uh, edit your Drupal markup where uh, your multiple, it'll have, you can have multiple domains that you'll set for DNS, point to a single server, and they'll modify the Drupal markup to output those multiple domains. So you can have those simultaneous, uh, more than six simultaneous downloads from Drupal. But honestly, that gets a little bit complicated. So, you know, CDNs are kind of the way to go. It's about a little mean guy. Kind of delivery that way. You kind of see how that works. I'm a big fan of the efficient HTML markup, which is like hilarious because I love Drupal. 
<laughs> but um, so clean your HTML, CSS will follow. Um, so there's like a couple ways to do this, and so Drupal can be, of course, have, has like a whole divide thing. It has so many overbearing wrapper divs, and, and especially if you get the panels, like holy cow, you know. Um, with panels, you can you can create custom panels layouts, which helps out um, the fences um, fences module. The fences module works pretty well. A great module is semantic views. Semantic views makes it really easy to, um, you, you know, when you go into views and you're modifying a field, you can actually, um, you can actually select H2 elements or whatever type of field that you want. Semantic views just makes that user interface a little bit better, makes it a little bit easier to use. Um, but obviously, you could be using view modes too, which is kind of a better way, more modular way to do stuff. So lower your bandwidth, gzip your static assets. Make sure they're cached by your browser. There's like uh, the YSlow plugin for uh, for your Chrome tools. I think maybe Firebug, where it'll actually give you a lot of tips for that type of stuff. Optimize your images, right? This is what I talked about earlier. JPEGs instead of pings. Um, if you if you don't need a ping, don't use a ping because they're dramatically much more needed there. Um, so. Background images of mobile. I mean, typically your content's taken up the full screen of your of your of your uh, smartphone anyway. So um, limit those background images based on your media query. We're done. It, so it doesn't download. It's not going to download them unless the media, unless your CSS tells you to do that. So you can kind of reduce your <coughs> reduce your bandwidth specifically for mobile just based on that, which is kind of just straightforward. So responsive images solutions. There's a couple different ones out there. I used to like use Borealis and Client Side Adaptive Image. You know, the one uh, to use right now is called Picture. Uh, responsive images is something that like the web has been trying to figure out for like a hell of a long time. And um, so there's a couple different proposals and stuff going through that different browsers are implementing, but the, the D8 picture module uses uh, the picture element in, in the correct the correct way and then I think it, it should I think it has a uh, JavaScript fallback uh, the JavaScript thing to make it. I, I forget the word. Yeah. Yeah should. Sure. It's efficient JavaScript, right? JavaScript execution is a lot longer on mobile, right? Because your mobile's slower than your computer. That makes sense. Uh, you can uh, you can put an async attribute and defer attribute within your JavaScript, um, and that will do exactly what you think it does. It'll <coughs> your JavaScript, if you put it in the head, will block the uh, DOM, uh, your 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 basically your HTML from rendering because it wants to render that it wants to parse that JavaScript first. So that that's this is all about the perception right here. You know, being fast, you want that HTML to load as soon as possible, and um, a couple ways to do that, put async and or deferred. Async means it's gonna kinda keep on processing it until while it's rendering. Deferred will wait till it's after the DOM is rendered. Um, you can also put your JavaScript into the into your footer, like right, right above the body tag. And that's really good if you're doing stuff like you have like some jQuery stuff in there that your 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 layout is not dependent on the JavaScript, but you know, it's it's something that kind of should be done, and I'll speed things up. <coughs> the Jabs part was just a a pretty good uh, resource for other stuff. So, all right. So I googled. And this is the demonstration time. I googled demonstration, huh. and this is like one of the pictures. I'm like, this is pretty cool, right? So I'm going to talk about screen reflow and scroll performance here. Everybody see the screen? I'm going to talk about a couple different things here. This is a website I did, it's not even Drupal. And uh, I'm going to talk about a couple different front end stuff here. So we got Chrome, let's get that idea. Right. 
So let's look at it. I'm going to hit refresh. So you can see each one of these right here is a uh, HTTP request. You can see uh, we have a total of 30 of them. See on the bottom right here where the mouse is on. Um, let's look at, you see over here where it's at the size area, where you have about 5.2 kilobytes and 14.4, that means it's being gzip. The size of the wire after, the, after it's compressed is 5.2 kilobytes, the original size is 14.4 kilobytes. You can click on this and see some of these HTTP headers here, and you can kind of see this in the response right here. You can see content encoding gzip right there. Um, you can see that this came in, shoot.sh came in in about a second, which is pretty fast because it's a static HTML, it's actually hosted on GitHub pages. Um, let's pull up, uh, let's pick on the website, should we get that, should we kind of see how quickly the loader You can see I'm logged in right here too. Refresh this one. Let's see. That's great. That's just a second. That's awesome. Um, that is about right. If you can, if you're using Varnish or something like that, you can you can knock that down to under a second. Um, something else I kind of want to talk about is screen reflow, right? So the reason I picked up this website is because I'm doing some bad practices on it. And um, if, you, if I scroll down, you, can, you see how that background picture is kind of fixed right there? So I'm going to talk about screen painting. I'm going to hit this little button over here. I'm going to check the box that says show pet re paint rectangles. So everything that is being painted is green. So you can see right there, the whole damn page is green, which is bad. You don't want the whole page to, to, to refresh right here. I'm going to show you a way to kind of fix that right here, at least an easy way. The problem is that it's fixed. <laughs> Now you can see the page is not repainting except the scroll bar over here. So I'm going to talk a couple things about that. But there's there's a uh, there's a if you have fixed elements, whether it's background attachment fixed or maybe position fixed, when you scroll, your browser will repaint repaint that whole area continuously, and that can that can make everything kind of janky. You see, like when stuff flashes, that you know, flashes down and stuff like that. Um, and it, just like really bad scroll performance. Like I, I have a couple websites I visit on my older iPad, and I'm going down, and it doesn't like scroll. And you're like, what? You know, what's going on here? It's, it's, it's this type of issue. A couple ways to fix that. There's a couple of CSS hacks. Um, there, what you can, if if you have fixed elements, what you can do is you can apply. Um, I don't really have an example right here, but I'm just going to type it in right here. You can do backface visibility. Uh, Hidden, and even though this isn't going to work in this case because it's not this, it's not going to solve this issue, but what it, what it will do is it'll actually tell the browser to promote this to a new layer, and at that point you can't it when it when it repaints it won't repaint that layer it'll just it'll just do what it's supposed to do. Um, if you have a Retina screen, sometimes if it, like. Maybe who here, oh, obviously I see a lot of Macs. Who here has retina screens or high DPI screens? Yeah, a bunch of people. But something that's like always catches you, catches you off guard is your ret. Chrome will tell your, if you have a high DPI screen, it will actually do this by default. But if you have a lower DPI screen, it won't. And the reason it does that is because for, I think it's called like subpixel aliasing, or subpixel font aliasing, where it kind of makes your fonts a little bit prettier. Um, you can kind of get around that by going back in, back in here and 
emulate your screen and set your pixel ratio and block. And at that point, you can maybe troubleshoot some issues that people are having. Um, another thing that's pretty important, if you're moving stuff around on your page, don't, and if you're doing any type of animations, transitions, JavaScript animations, don't animate stuff using top or left or right or margins or anything like that. Use translate. Use uh, CSS3 2D trans transformations. Um, your browser will handle that a lot better, and in, in certain, it, it can offload some of that work to the GPU, which the GPU is optimized for that type of stuff, and will make everything a lot smoother. Um, you can see here, you see how I scroll down and like the little navigation thing over here is not repainting? That's, that's because I'm doing that right there. So when you get over here, maybe I can show you an option. Show you again. Um, you're going to want to you're going to want to use translate x, translate y, uh, and then use backface visibility hidden. Or there's another similar one called I think it's like translate z that will do the same thing. I'll promote it up on its own layer. There's a new CSS property common called um, will change. It'll do the exact same thing, but and it's uh, it's just a little bit more semantic. That's pretty. I, I always think that's pretty interesting right there. Right. Use that from credit. Yeah, whatever. I might have to kind of use the PowerPoint on the back. It's interesting. Which is like crazy. It's like your life is flashing before your eyes, right? I too many slides here. Discussing very large issues, large scale issues. Um, Getter's Guide for Caching, and data, caching data in Drupal 7 is, is a great article written by uh, Jeff Ewing at uh, Lenlock. Um, there's a couple different articles here Top 10 Drupal Performance Hit and uh, uh, a good presentation from uh, Drupal City, all the stuff there. Uh, back end resources right here, there's this great one from Drupalize uh, Me. Uh, overview of performance and scalability by Nate Hogg, Chris Gushy, this guy who wrote uh, Webpool. And um, <clears throat> everything on 2bits.com, which this is a uh, Canadian guy named uh, Anyway, uh, he's, his, his mantra is simplify things and kind of getting simplify things and tuning things and not adding complexity. I'm a big believer for, for, for reducing complexity. He has this great article right here, Zen versus Virtually versus Virtuosa, uh, which are two kind of underlying technologies of cloud computing. Um, some front end resources, which is, you know, start here, right? So, um, Jake Free, high performance websites. Um, and let's do simple stuff to make our website faster by Chris Coyer, which is just kind of pretty interesting. Um, that's it, right? So after party tonight, we can talk about this stuff. Right? Drupal, Con, or Drupal Camp Asheville, like hell yeah, thanks for everybody that's any organizing. I'm on Twitter, you can hackle me and say like, you really sucked. Um, that's kind of about it, you know, you guys have any questions or anything like that? All right, not you. <laughs> What's up, man?
So um, on the limiting limited HTTP requests, have you ever looked at trying Speedy? No. It's a um, it's a protocol that's the base protocol for the HTTP two standard, and what that does is everything is sent via a different connection. No, I didn't I didn't realize that. I, I, I thought Speedy was like there's a TCP slow start. Are you familiar with that? Where yeah. It, like within like a TCP IP protocol, like the TCP protocol, it'll it'll ramp up the bandwidth and then go. Yeah, no, this is, is it's separate different. concurrent connections. There's a module for Apache and a module for Nginx to enable it. Will, will browsers support that out of the box? Um, yeah, most browsers support it nowadays. I think anything below IE8 doesn't, but then it just falls back on a normal HTTP request at that point. That's not what I'm going to look into. I, I it's no developed idea. by Google. It's the base for HTTP2. Um, the only thing is it requires the site to be under SSL, which you should be anyways at this day and age. So. So it requires SSL? Yeah, it requires it to be under SSL. Oh, that's interesting. Cool. That's something I'm going to Google. Derek, what's up? So just a suggestion. If you're using the Percona config yeah. and you happen to be, you know, you set up a Percona config for your Mac, which which I, I do, um, it, can, it can really mess up uh, the default settings on your Mac for the number of files open. It's not high enough to work with that config that comes out of the box. Yeah, and so <laughs> just watch out, because then you start playing with the number of open file limit on your computer, and it actually caused my laptop to just totally die because I set a bad setting and then restarted. Um, so there's something to keep your, you know, hopefully this voice comes back to you when you're setting it up on your Mac and it dies, and you're like, what the fuck? Um, yeah, file, number of file open limit with the Percona config for your Mac might, might run into an issue. So, gotcha. Yeah. So if anybody runs into that, contact Derek. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Any other questions? Or Go ahead. Uh, this is more of a question. Uh, so, have you run into any issues with the aggregation for CSS, like aggregating stuff in the wrong order, and then that's screwing with? Uh, so. Yeah, kind of. You know, so like CSS has like whole cascading things. You know, if, you, if you're using the exact same uh, selector rules twice, and the one that comes second will take precedence. So that can definitely screw things up. But honestly. If you're doing that, you should you should kind of be handling this more on like the CSS level, doing doing some more kind of modular type CSS where um, you, it, it it could be an issue, and if it is an issue, fix it. You know, troubleshoot and fix it. I mean, I mean that's basically it. And you know, yeah. So it, it's, it could be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about JSA versus things. How about WebP? I don't really use WebP. Does I support WebP yet? Does anybody know? I think it requires a plugin. Let's do that. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you're doing WebP, you need to fall back on JTAG or a ping. Yeah. It's not to that point where everything supports it. Like, I, I it sounds awesome, uh, but at the same time, like, if I have to worry about fallbacks and I have to worry about all this other stuff, I'm just going to go with with JPEG. I mean, I guess there's situations where it, you know, if your if your primary target is developers, you know, all those are going to be using Chrome or Firefox or something like that. You could you could probably implement that and screw that in people, or at that point worry about worry about uh, worry about fallbacks. That's the problem we all want, right? Yeah, for developers. Yeah, exactly. You have another question? Yeah, because there's a module called Mod HP by Google. Okay. That will automatically auto translate your really? image format. Well, well optimize it for you on the phone. Well, that's, that's news to me, and that's awesome. So, yeah, yeah, that's actually pretty cool. Then. I'm gonna, that's another thing for me to look into. That works. So that exists as a web service, too, so you don't even need the Drupal module. Just Google. Um, page speed insights okay. and give it the URL and it will analyze it, figure out everything you do wrong, and it even looks for things that Google search engine looks for yeah. for page ranks. So it'll point it out. They'll do things like image optimization for you. So if you go, this image not optimized, click here to download our optimized one and yeah, all that for you automatically. I should actually put that in my presentation. The, uh, uh, that's the message. The, the page speed insights or whatever. That's important. Anybody else? Thanks.